Welcome, my friends, to yet another episode of the Mind Dog TV podcast, another edition of Meet the Author. I got a good one for you tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, outlaw biker culture, uh, motorcycle clubs, and uh, basically the life uh, within. Now, I, it's not the first time we've talked about this subject, and I think I've made, uh, uh, made it clear about all the experience I've had uh, playing as a musician for various uh, biker clubs and uh, my exposure to some of them on that level uh, never been uh, in one myself known lots of people in them uh, but I've oh, <coughs> excuse me always been fascinated by the life my guest tonight is a, a very prolific author on the subject and has a world of experience in it uh, Edward Winterhalder is an American author who has written more than 25 books about motorcycle clubs and outlaw biker culture. Excuse me, folks. I'm sorry. My voice just went to hell right as we started the program. Published in the English, French, and Ger German and Spanish languages. A television producer who has created programs about motorcycle clubs and the outlaw biker lifestyle for networks and broadcasters worldwide. A singer, songwriter as well, musician and record producer and screenwriter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please open your ears, open your minds, and help me welcome in. Edward uh, Winterhalter to the Mind Dog TV podcast. Ed Edward, welcome. I need to take a drink. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure. Now, uh, the I, uh, 25 books is a lot of books, and, and there's a lot of them uh, that I'm interested in. But the ones I'm – one that is actually two that I'm most interested in is the autobiography. Um, so uh, if you could uh, – first of all, what part of the, the world did you grow up in? Where, where are you from? I grew up in uh, Southern Connecticut. Okay. I uh, went off to the Army the day I turned 17, a couple of days after I turned 17. I uh, came back and I and, uh, got my first Harley in uh, November of 74 and pretty much have not been without one since. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I took off uh, shortly thereafter in the spring of 75. Uh, I was sick of the cold weather and shoveling snow. And uh, found my way to Oklahoma, to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, okay, that explains it. Because I was going to say, in this part of the country, and you probably are, are more aware of this than, this than I am of this. In this uh, part of the country, I'm on Long Island, which is not far from Connecticut. And there are two prominent uh, biker clubs that people know about in, the, in this part of the country. And some of the other ones, some of the ones that might be bigger than or or on the same number of uh, um, members like the Hells Angels and Pagans, uh, we're not that aware of them in this part of the country, at least you know, people who aren't involved in the lifestyle. Were you part of one of those other uh, clubs? I first got started uh, with a regional club uh, in Oklahoma. They were in northern Texas, southern Kansas, and all of Oklahoma. Um, and through my association with that organization, I got introduced to a lot of other organizations and, uh, eventually migrated to the Banditos. The Banditos. Now that's a, a big one that most people in this area are not very familiar with. Um, and, and I just want, are there more that we're not familiar with? <laughs> oh yeah, there's... <laughs> In this day and age, there's probably a couple of thousand motorcycle clubs in America alone. So, uh, is, is it bitter rivalry, or or do they get along for the most part? Yeah, you know, that's not something I can speak to in this day and age. Back in the day, depending on who you were, is whether you got along with somebody or not. Me personally, I got along with all of the major clubs worldwide, but that was on an individual basis. So, okay. you know, it depends on who you meet at what time of day and what time of night. And What attracted you to the club? I mean, I used to talk about having a Harley in Connecticut, but what attracted you to the club life? So I don't, how do you get into it? You know, it's the camaraderie. It's the brotherhood. It's having fun with people and enjoy the same type of things that you do. Um, and that was a long time ago. You know, it was back then. It was uh, an easy migration for me to do. You know, I found a lot of people that were like me that enjoyed motorcycles and enjoyed riding and having fun. And when I got started in a lifestyle, it was, 
you know, 99% fun and 1% bullshit. <laughs> you know, that changes over the years, though. It's hard to describe the lifestyle because there is no specific type of member, you know, across the board. Uh, every chapter is different, ran differently by different people. The people in the chapter are all different. And uh, because most clubs, you know, are, are very apt to take in anyone and uh, that enjoys the lifestyle to a degree, it opens it opens the the world, the playing field, into just a lot of different types of people. Uh, I'm basically thinking that it would be very hard to get in, very exclusive. But you say anybody who really enjoys the lifestyle and it seemed like a friendly um, welcome in. You know, back then, you're talking almost 50 years ago, right? Right. And at that time, and I don't say that they'd welcome you in as a member, but they'd welcome like-minded people, you know, we associated uh, all the time. So, you know, that was your introduction to motorcycle clubs. Right. It was very easy to hang out with them, ride around with them. And then at that point in time, you had to figure out whether you wanted to pursue that lifestyle. And they had to figure out if they wanted to let you actually join and become a member. And that's across the board for every motorcycle club. And, and how long would that kind of screening take? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's different for every person on the planet. Nothing's set in concrete. You know, some clubs say, well, you got to hang around for a year or two, or you got to do this, you got to do that. I don't think there's anything that's definitive. Um, you know, it, it, it changes and it has changed depending on who the person is, you know, what club he's getting into and what chapter he's going to become a member of because the chapters have different priorities and are run differently. Now, uh, obviously, uh, when I talk about this stuff and when I talk about the culture, outlaw is the first word, outlaw biker culture. Uh, and the, the titles of your book, um, I love you. Autobiography, Searching for My Identity, Volume 1, The Chronological Evolution of a Troubled Adolescent into the Outlaw Biker, the Two Outlaw Biker and Searching for My Identity, and the Volume 2, Chronological Evolution of Outlaw Biker to uh, Road to Redemption. Now, both of those obviously have the word outlaw in it. Were you, was that at all, was it something that you uh, were aware of and, you know, the outlaw part of it, and was something you might have been ambivalent about, or you did you accept that? that part of it uh, willfully knowing you're getting into something that is uh, seen as outlaw and, and uh, not welcomed by society. Well, when I was young, I didn't know that I was an outlaw. I just knew the way that I lived and what I did. And I was, you know, happy to have found people that were similar to me uh, and that enjoyed the same things that I did. You know, your perception of things changes as time goes on and you get older. You know, now I've got the benefit of looking back at everything. The autobiography is, is designed specifically for the academic community. That's, you know, that's someone, what I'm curious about, because obviously you are an academic and you're, you're a writer and uh, we the stereotype, you don't think of, of people involved in clubs like this as, as being all that, you know, well-educated or, or thoughtful. And, and then you become an author. That's a, that's a, uh, a different thing. It breaks the stereotype that most people have in their minds about this stuff. And again, it's, you know, where they were when they met somebody, right? Right. You know, I had a good friend when I was a bandito. He was a pediatrician. I, I relied on him heavily every time I, I was a single dad with custody. When my daughter got sick. I would call him. You know, I, I knew club members that were attorneys. I knew club members that were from all walks of life across the board. You know, they did every type of job known to man. And then on the other side of the coin, you know, I met some that didn't work, that, you know, did illegal things their entire life. So it is a broad spectrum of personalities and, and people that you run into when you're part of a motorcycle organization, you know, depending on the level that club is at in the hierarchy. So would it be fair to say that uh, basically you, you can walk away, because it seemed like you just walked away from the life. And this is what I mean, because uh, it doesn't seem like, once once you're in something like that and you get exposed to maybe some of the people who are doing some stuff that are uh, um, hi highly illegal, uh, that you're walking away from, from uh, 
I don't know how organized it is. I'm, I want to say organization. Club. You're walking away from a club. That wouldn't necessarily be welcome. It, it, but you can just walk away. You can just quit the life. Of course you can quit the life. You know, if you leave the club in good standings and you haven't screwed anybody and you don't owe money and uh, things like that, yeah, of course, people walk away all the time. But really? you don't hear those kind of stories. You know, you hear some bad story from someone who burned somebody on some type of drug deal or something, or he messed around with somebody else's old lady. You know, there's always a cause for it. You know, he wasn't able to walk away because right. of what he did. So, again, you know, it depends on who you are, what your chapter is, what club you're in, and, you know, a lot of other factors in the situation. But people get out of the lifestyle all the time. Right. How long have you been out? Uh, almost 20 years right now. Okay. And when did you start writing about the life? <laughs> Basically, a month or two after I got out. So I left the Banditos in September of 2003 and started writing about my life and the things that I'd experienced uh, probably in October of 2003. So I've been at this almost 20 years right now, no, I, I, this brand and all these books. At that point, had you had experience writing anything? Were you, were you like journal? I mean, while you were in there, I mean, did you have practice in writing before you... you started to write about the club no i was an avid reader i always have been since i was a kid and there was very very little information out there and there still is to this day but back in 2003 there was just a handful of books that had been written on the subject matter and most of them had been written by outsiders that didn't have a clue as to what was going on. There was another group of people that had written books about their uh, wonderful experience of getting arrested and ratting on all their brothers or, you know, infiltrating, you know, some organization. Uh, but I actually wanted to write a book about, you know, the real lifestyle, what it was like. You know, 80% of the guys are just regular run-of-the-mill working guys back then. You know, the only thing they were guilty of is having too much fun on the weekend. <laughs> you know, that 10 or 20 percent, the other guys, they were the ones that created the headlines that you read about. You know, they created probably 90 percent of the headlines that you either read about or you saw on television, you know, due to their whatever their motives were at the time. When did you uh, when did the writing parlay into television production and, and film production? Really quick after uh, my first book came out, I think the first one that that probably i got involved in was uh, an hbo series called one percent and gangland was right around that same time and then the outlaw biker series on natural geographic i had also also got involved with that and that was all in between 2005 and 2010 are all your i'm sorry to interrupt you are, are all your books non-fiction completely non-fiction or, do, or is there any part that is like fictionalized no, I write, uh, I'm really strange. I write nonfiction and fiction. I've got, uh, right now I've got 17 fiction books in four languages and the rest are nonfiction. So right now today there's, uh, 42 of my books are out there. Okay. Now, cause the, the reason I ask about this is I think, and, and uh, I'd love to get your perspective on this. We as uh, a culture, a society, we get a lot of the beliefs and perceptions we have about the clubs from mostly from fiction, mostly from television shows and movies and, and stuff like that. Uh, would you say that what you've seen like on network television and in, in mainstream films is generally an ac accurate product, uh, presentation of the life? There's been very little that's been accurate about the lifestyle. You know, it, it's created with certain aspects of the lifestyle in mind uh, and it's designed to portray membership a certain way but as far as being accurate uh, there's very little out there you know yeah. that'll give you a good snapshot of the lifestyle yeah that's what i would think because hollywood i mean i was kind of talking about this this morning they say uh, truth is stranger than fiction but Fiction is more entertaining, and so people take creative license with it. Uh, so from what you say, and I, I'm not going to, maybe I should. I don't know. I'm torn between whether I should name some of the, the 
the title, you know, the shows and, and movies I'm thinking of. No, don't even glorify them. Okay. There's no need. People that are listening know what we're talking about, know who yeah. we're talking about. You're but right. There is very little in the way of, you know, obviously dramatic television is designed to entertain audiences with uh, drama, right? Stuff that's right. not true. So right. it is what it is, right? People from my world, they look at this stuff as comedies, right? You know, because they're so outrageously funny. The things that they betray on screen are just absolutely ridiculous. So right. far from regular life, right? Uh, regular life for most of the guys is getting out of bed in the morning and going to work and coming home and dealing with their family. You know, that most of them have got kids, wives, ex-wives, you know, whatever is going on in their lives, right? That is by and large what most people are dealing with. Others have their own agendas and what they want to do. You know, some people wear the patch uh, to promote their agenda. They wear it like a, it was a tool in their toolbox. You know, they, they, need, they need to wear the patch. You know, that becomes a different thing on what they're doing every day of their lives. But a lot of times, you know, within a chapter, guys don't see each other all week. You know, they get together one night a week or one afternoon a week and try to all get together and hang out a little bit. But everybody has their own lives, and they're, they're doing their own things. You know, it's not like uh, I laughed when you said earlier, organized. Uh, it's disorganized across the board, especially the criminal aspects to it. Definitely yeah. organized crime. And, <laughs> you know, even though it has a structure and a hierarchy and presidents and, and officers and things like that, it's still disorganized. You know, by nature, these are outlaw bikers, right? So it's kind of like herding cats or sitting on a barrel full of monkeys, right? <laughs> you, know, you can't predict what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, every day it's something different. You seem like you have fond memories of it, like like this was a good time in your life. And if that is true, and I, I don't mean to, I, I guess I should ask that first. If that is true, uh, you know, why would you walk away from it? Yeah, the majority of it, of what I remember now, right? You know, I do have fond memories of it. I also have some memories that I wished I didn't have, right? Because those things happen during, you know, 28 years in the lifestyle. But walking away from it, you know, I, I had to put priorities in my life. And at that time, my daughter was uh, about 10 years old. I knew I had four or five more years with her before she started driving and had her own circle of friends and all that. And I wanted to put some time into her. I had a new woman in my life that, you know, was having a huge impact on me and still is to this day. You know, when I was uh, almost 50 years old, it was getting harder to get out there in that fast lane and run 90 miles an hour across the country every day. So, you know, I just wanted to slow down a little. I had a booming construction business and I wanted to devote some time to that. Uh, so between the family, the construction business, and construction management business, and uh, you know, writing down things while I could still remember them vividly was my priority uh, after I got out of the Banditos in 2003. Doing all that, and you're, you're doing uh, writing and <laughs> well, can, running a construction company, run, ha having a family, and writing and working on film productions as well, uh, that, that's a quite a full life, a, a uh, you know, 24 hour day, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, it's hard to manage all that. You're self-published, correct? Correct. Uh, coming out of, you know, coming out of the motorcycle club world and losing all my responsibilities and gaining all the time that I spent with the club after I left the club, you know, it opened the door for other things. I was able to put more time to my family more time in my construction management business, and obviously still have a little time to write. So that went well. And what was that second question you asked there? Well, it, it's just uh, it, uh, basically um, the self-published part of it. And oh, yeah. It, yeah. Self-publishing used to have a stigma like it was a bad thing, but I think now, and I'll let you speak to this, I think now it's, it's probably the only way to really be the master of your own destiny financially uh, and creatively. And I think, you know, smart people are generally going to self-publish, even if they have the opportunity of going with a, a traditional publisher. I just want to get your take on that. Now, it's interesting for me because I tried to do the conventional thing, I reached out to literary agents and publishers, and nobody was interested. 
you know, and here we are almost 20 years later. Uh, I've had conversations or traded emails with over a thousand agents worldwide now and never found one that could do anything for me. I have had conventional publishing deals. Typically, they were outside this country. Uh, I had one in Australia. I had one in uh, Europe and one in Canada, two in Canada that were very interesting and, and certainly successful, but they were originated not through agents. You know, they were uh, originated through contact, right? It's interesting. So for me in the beginning, it was, I never thought I'd be an author. I just wanted to write down everything that I could while I could still remember it and turn it into a class book. And I wanted the photographs to be on the rightful pages where they were supposed to be. I was so naive. But in order to do that, you have to use gloss paper and you end up with a book that weighs a, a ton. That's why all those picture books that sit on the coffee table weigh so much. So I wound up with a, a very interesting book called Out in Bad Standings that did real well. Uh, it was number one at, at Barnes and Noble and, uh, you know, it did fine. But back in those days, you know, we, for, we got orders through eBay from overseas and we had to ship the book out. And by the time it got all done, the amount of money we spent shipping and, and for printing the book and because it was so heavy, it was over two pounds. You know, in the end, it was not a financial windfall. Right. Uh, but I learned a lot from that. And I probably would have stopped right then and there if it hadn't been for, you know, some other things that happened. And at some point in time, probably by 2010, I realized that for whatever reason, you know, I guess it was my destiny to try to capture this lifestyle accurately and preserve it for de generations to come. You know, it's interesting when you talk about self-publishing back then versus self-publishing now. So back in 2005, there was approximately 50,000 new titles a year in North America. And it was a fairly easy market to crack when you were writing a book about the outlaw biker lifestyle because there was so little material out there. You own the niche. <laughs> yeah, I, it was easy then, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, there were, you know, after the pandemic set in, uh, I heard there was 2 million new titles in North America. And now because of artificial uh, intelligence, AI, I've heard that there's going to be 5 million books next year, new titles, because everyone, you know, can sit down with AI and, and basically uh, author a book within a week. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, I've, I've experimented with it a little bit just to see what it'll do. And it's crazy what I can produce in two hours using AI. So self-publishing now and, you know, to back then is totally different. Right. And for most people, you know, that are going to write a book, you know, the, the reality of the situation is they need to count up the number of friends and family they have in their life. And that's the number of books they're going to sell. You know, that's going to be the end of it for most people. Yeah. To, to continue <laughs> on and sell books on a regular basis, on a monthly basis for a long period of time without a major publisher behind them or even a good independent publisher, it's rare. It's very, very rare. You know, if I had been a expert at knitting and wrote a book about knitting, I would have never gone anywhere. You know, <laughs> I, I was just fortunate that the lifestyle I had led, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of material about it then. There wasn't a lot of material written about it in 2010. And even today, there's only, I would bet there's less than 250 books ever been published worldwide uh, on the subject matter. And I've got 42 of them. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's very, very unusual. And when you take, let's just say that there are 250 books, I would bet that 50 of them were written by people that ratted somebody out. Uh, so I'm going to remove them from the list. Uh, another 50 were written by law enforcement or journalists right. that relied on law enforcement notes Yep. newspaper articles, right? And earlier we talked about the 10 or 20% that produce 90% of the headlines. You know, they, those are the stories that they put in those books. So now you're down to 100, 150 books, right? And, you know, some of them are just, you know, they're not really outlaw biker books. They're a little bit on the biker lifestyle. Uh, you know, I probably got 100 of them in my personal library. But when you get right down to it, there's very few books out there that are ever accurately de depicted the lifestyle, you know, from 
all of the different personalities that are involved in it. Right. The first one I can think of is is The Rebels, which was written uh, uh, by Daniel Wolf in 1991, published by the University of Toronto. It still sells today. He was a member of The Rebels up there in Canada at the time for about a year uh, and did his doctorate or his thesis on the club with the club's permission after he left the club. And although he changed all the names, it was a very accurate depiction at that time of the different personalities that he ran into within his own organization. And I was talking earlier about the perspective that you get. You know, if, if all you do is go to the bar and drink, then you tend to base your opinion of the outlaw motorcycle club members world on the people that you met inside that bar. Absolutely. On the other hand, you, um, I'll give you a great example. I was building the Collin County Courthouse in uh, Plano, Texas in 2000. Uh, I was the lead superintendent on the job site. I had 200 people there working for me. And half the superintendents there were banditos. We interfaced with, with the sheriff's department, everybody when we were building the courthouse, right? So their opinion of the outlaw club members that they met was totally different than someone's opinion who's drunk at the bar every Friday night, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, dep I it depends who you hang out with, right? Not long ago, I read somebody's thesis and they had hung out with someone who was dealing drugs. So their opinion of what outlaw club members were like, you know, was uh, formed on what they saw. And the only thing they saw was a drug dealer who right. happened to somehow got a patch, right? Right. So it depends who you see at what time. You know, was the outlaw motorcycle club member mad when you met them? And right. when did he have a reason to be mad, right? Right. You know, or did you meet him through normal course of life, right? Right. You know, uh, did you meet him? He was on the soccer field uh, cheering on his daughter in the middle of a soccer game, right? Yep. It depends who you meet and what time you meet them and what they do socially, job-wise, employment-wise, whatever, right, on the reaction you get and the opinion you walk away with. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. I think I opened up with saying that my perception of, uh, of biker clubs was based on my being in a band. And, and this is the social situation that you're talking about. Bands in bars, they'd find us in a bar. Of course, lots of alcohol flowing and drug use going on there. We'd be invited to uh, play events. I don't even want to call them parties because they sometimes in, in, very hideaway places they built stages that nobody knew it was like a secret entrance by an invitation only and bad things would go on there and that was the only perception i had of them for the most part until years later after that scene was all, all over and somebody i knew uh had a house burned down and the first people that came this i'll tell you the story as quickly as i can because i don't want to take away from telling your story uh i was at the one of the events i was at i had a video camera this is early 80s and video cameras were new and well, showing the camera all over the place trying to get some footage of us playing a concert for this uh, biker club, and somebody said, get the guy in the hat. The guy had a uh, coonskin hat, and I pointed the camera at him. Next thing I know, I'm getting hit in the back, and they're taking my camera from me, and now they're playing monkey in the middle with me, throwing it around. Oh, this is all funny. And I went to grab a guy who had the camera, and he said, take your fucking hands off me. And before I knew it, there were like a 100 guys ready to kill me. The president of the club, who was uh, the guy who hired us, knew me, and he was a friend of mine. He said, "Get, leave him alone. He took me to the side. He said, you can't do that here. You're going to get killed. So that was the impression I had. These guys are all, you know, crazy, ready to kill you over. And the guy I was shooting, by the way, was a criminal and didn't want to be on, on film, and they had good reasons for not wanting him on videotape. But the next time I saw those guys, five of the same guys who were ready to kill me, was at uh, the house of somebody whose house burnt down, and they were volunteering uh, time and effort to kind of uh, rebuild their house and, and and put. And I was like, "Wow, that's a that's a change of perspective on who these people really were." But you're right; perception is where you meet them, the time, and your experience of the life that they live is based on that. So, 
Uh, Correct. Just, yeah. So, you know, you'll hear from someone who ran into somebody at the wrong time. And, you know, it was a bad situation. But then when you explore the situation, you know, well, how did that start? Right. Right. Uh, you know, and typically there is a reason for that. Right. Yeah. So I, I just try to, to tell people across the board that there is no such thing as a typical outlaw motorcycle club member. It just doesn't exist. Right. right. But can, I, worth, can, can right? I interrupt for a second? It, yeah. are, there are certain uh, cultural things that, that are run across the board, like colors and patches and, and uh, women and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. There are some, I don't want to call them rules, but basic staples of the life or no. You know, again, it depends where you are and what's going on, right? And who's in charge. Everybody's got different rules, right? Depending depending who's in charge and where you are, what chapter you're in. You know, some chapters, every member in there is, is a criminal. Other chapters, everybody's working. And again, it doesn't matter what club it is. That's the way it is. You know, somebody that comes to mind real quick, Donnie Peterson. He was a Hells Angel in Toronto, owned heavy-duty cycles for years, just died recently. Great guy, uh, very intelligent, uh, outstanding mechanic. His entire chapter, everybody had a job and there was no drugs allowed at all in his chapter. So it, it depends, again, where you're at and what's going on uh, and who's in charge and what his rules are in that chapter. And again, every chapter you go to basically has different rules. Yes, some right. things are the same you know, on their face, right? But it's still, there is no set rhyme or reason. You know, it's not the same everywhere, right? right. Well, very what, few aspects of it that are the same. What do you think, uh, and first of all, who, who is the demographic that's reading your books? Is it guy, older guys like me? Is it young guys? I mean, who, is it women? <laughs> who is your demographic? That's the million-dollar question. I always <laughs> wish I knew the answer to that. No one's ever been able to figure it out. Uh, I know my books have been crossing over the academic arena for a long time. Back in 2006, 2007, 2008, Barnes & Noble, in its first incarnation, had Barnes & Noble bookstores on college campuses. Uh, that eventually went down the tubes by 2010. It's been revived now. It's a whole new different deal. But back then, I got reports, and I knew it was happening, uh, that the books were being sold. And sometimes they were using the books for mandatory reading and uh, uh, sociology, um, ethnography, anthropology classes, things like that. Uh, so I think I, I, I have a following in the academic community worldwide to a degree. Trying to crack that nut has been very difficult without the backing of an academic publisher. Uh, I have talked to a lot of them. They're all really interested, but in this day and age, everything's got to be approved by a board, and they just don't think they can get the approval. You know, yeah. you talk just because you talk to an editor doesn't mean you're going to get the deal done. And then the thing that really mystifies me, uh, and these are based on conversations from the last year, is it takes them somewhere between two and four years to publish a book, and two is very unusual. So typically, it's three to four years. Uh, me, I can publish a book. Once the book is completely written, uh, we design in-house. We do everything, every aspect of it in-house. Uh, we produce our print-on-demand files, our ebook files, everything in-house. But once that's all done, I can publish worldwide within the space of a week. Right. You know, when I'm in 40,000 libraries, I'm in 10,000 academic institutions, uh, and I'm basically everywhere books are sold whether you want to hold it in your hand or if you want to read it on an ebook reader. It allows me to control my destiny. Uh, I am the master of my destiny. Uh, I don't have to listen to somebody to try to tell me what they think needs to be done. I want to be able to write what I want to write and do it my way. Uh, and that's almost impossible to do when you have a conventional publisher publishing your book. They're going to tell you how to write it, after you write it, they're going to destroy it and change it to what they think's right. <laughs> and then they're going to publish it. Now, will it sell? Who knows? They don't even know. You know, they bet their money on 100 books a year or 300 books a year or whatever. And all they're hoping for is one as a runaway seller that pays for 
the books that they bet their money on. Right, and I get it. But the the and for an author, I just kind of want to mention this because we do have other authors who, who listen to it at this, and uh, some of them struggle with the whole self publishing thing. But I think with the traditional publishing uh, aspect, the only benefit, and maybe you 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 have a different opinion on this, but I think the only uh, benefit of being with them is the marketing that the the dollars they will push behind. But that's not so true anymore. It, maybe that used to be true, but it's not as true as it used to be that if they have something they believe in, they will put the money behind it and, and take care of some of the publica- uh, the publicity of it and promotion of, of the book. That's the only advantage I see. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that? You know, that might have been so quite a while ago, but I had a friend who was uh, an executive editor at Random House. He was a Harley guy. Uh, I used to hang out with him at the book expos every year, but I remember him vividly. I remember him telling me that, you know, I said, uh, you know, how do you sell books? Right. He said, shit, if anyone knew that our company, every book we publish would be a runaway sell millions of books. Right. When you think about that. Right. So he said, you know, we really don't know. We just bet on it. Sometimes we put a hundred thousand into marketing and we don't sell anything and we lose our ass. He said, other times, We'll put 10,000 into marketing and all of a sudden we'll sell a million copies. He said, there's only one thing that sells books and that's people you don't know talking to other people that you don't know about your book. Right. And he said, you can't make that happen. That's all there is to it. Well, I'm not proud of this, uh, but I have to confess that I worked as a marketing guy for a company that is part of the problem that you mentioned before with the instant insane amount of titles published every year and a lot of them were using ai before it was not using it as a tool but completely writing ai to write the book or more accurately what they would do was uh put the author uh the prospective author who not a writer put, give them a podcast set them up with interviews record those interviews transcribe those interviews and have somebody who is an editor sit down and put those together in book form and put them out and they were putting out hundreds of titles per week flooding the market which was essentially crap it's not really it's not really good content not well written stuff it is just there to put stuff out and they would boost artificially boost stuff to number one by putting it out and i'm giving away secrets but good <laughs> use these secrets. they put it out there for free download so that people would would download it to move it to the top of bestseller and then put a price on it after it got uh, like on an amazon bestseller list and artificially create through a web of bots and people who were just paid to write reviews create reviews to boost stuff up in the presence of stuff so how do you how do you combat that as a lone self publishing guy who's actually writing books when you have all these uh people that just that's just one your company doing that and there's lots of companies in competition with that how do you yeah. how do you deal with that how do you battle that you know for me uh i'm fortunate because I'm writing in a genre that it's kind of hard to write fake shit in, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that there's a huge demand for information about the lifestyle uh, because it's so secretive. But you are correct uh, that the realities of marketing in 2023, you know, they've changed drastically. What worked five or 10 years ago uh, Facebook groups or email campaigns or any of that shit, uh, you know, that doesn't really work anymore. And with the sheer volume of new titles, uh, you know, like book reviews, I remember in 2008 when we had the Canadian publisher, you know, they, they wanted to get pre book reviews, right. And they were really important at the time. Well, now if you thought about that and you're going to have two years ago, there was 2 million new titles. If each one got five book reviews, You've got 10 million book reviews. <laughs> Who's got the time to read 10 million book reviews, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it, there's so much information out there that, in my opinion, and to w- what we've tried, nothing is successful. And it goes back to that editor at Random House telling me that the only thing that sells books is someone you don't know telling somebody else you don't know about your book, and you did not create that situation. Right. That is it. So, 
for me, you know, I'm fortunate because I have subject matter that people are interested in. I'm fortunate because there's not a lot of material, factual material written about this lifestyle. And hopefully I'll continue to do this as long as I possibly can. But I suspect in the next couple of years, we're going to see the landscape change a bunch more. Right. So right now you can feed your book into Bard, for example, or uh, Chat GPT, and it'll edit it better than a human, you know, in the matter of minutes. I, I, I watched a YouTube video the other day of a guy who created a beautiful, uh, I don't know if you call them storybooks for kids, picture books. Yeah. I'm going to call it a picture storybook, right, for children. He created it in less than a week, totally from AI, you know, uh, Chat GPT. Uh, did the uh, the narration in it, uh, you know, the text, and then another uh, AI creator created all of the uh, cartoon-like avatars that were in the book. Another company printed it, and he had it on Kindle in less than a week. And it's just absolutely a beautiful story, uh, a beautiful put-together book, uh, put together for pennies. And in you know, a book like that used to take a year or two to just to produce. Yeah. So there's a revolution going on right now. It's yeah, happening I, fast, too, and it feels yes. like it's blowing past me. Because I, I was thinking about this today. In the early 90s, I was learning HTML, and I was behind the curve, uh, yeah. HTML program. I was behind the curve, but I learned it pretty quick. And but and then all of a sudden, I was in, in an in-demand guy, a, a webmaster, all of a sudden, and that was like the the job of the future. And, you know, all these <laughs> magazines were ready. You got to be in the web programming world. And that's how I feel now with chat GTP and or whatever AI tools that are out there is that six months ago, I wouldn't have thought that I need to learn AI yet. Now, it, within the last six months, it's exploded so much that I feel like I should have learned it, started learning about this stuff, how to apply it to what I do two, five years ago, two to five years ago, something like that. And I'd still probably be, be behind the curve. So it's, it's a frightening thing for me. There's AI platforms out there, Matt that you can feed samples of your writing into and it will learn how to recreate your tone and voice basically the way you write right <laughs> so i could write a partial paragraph about a par part let's say i write two pages of material about something right once i've trained it to mimic my tone and voice i can feed those two pages in there and and ask the ai to expand on what i've written and within four or five seconds, I now have 10 pages. Wow. And it's and if you were reading it, you would not know because it's generated as if it was me. So these are the revolutions that are coming upon us in the near future. Uh, one of my co-authors, I was talking to him the other day. He had a friend, uh, for a longtime friend, and she was uh, she does uh, narration for audiobooks and also does voiceovers for television used to be booked out six months at a time. And he talked to her. This was probably early May. Uh, and she said she had absolutely no bookings anymore. Everybody started canceling about six months ago. And and boom, it's all gone. And she said, you know, her job, which has been doing for, apparently for 10 years or more, it just evaporated overnight because right. of AI. So, yes, there is a revolution here. It is, you know, a lot of people are using it for good reasons. Some people are going to use it for bad reasons, right? But being an author in the future, you know, if you are trying to write about something that is not unique, and I'll go back to the knitting analogy, right? <laughs> if you took 10 of the best knitters in the world and got them together to write a book, AI can write a better book because it's using a thousand knitters <laughs> and it can write it in the space of a couple of hours where those 10 knitters are going to take years to write that book. Right? I'm sorry to laugh, but I, I, as a, uh, somebody who's generally comedically inspired, I, I have this uh, vision of you know, like a angry, because I get a lot of hate mail. I'm just like an angry mob of knitters waiting outside my door. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it would be funny. But yeah, the revolution's here, and I, you know everyone's got to get with the program. I think it's going to be harder and harder and harder for, in general, to sell books, right? Right. Uh, me, I don't think so. Uh, the shelf life of an average book, even for a random house or penguin or somebody like that, uh, is like a year or two. And then they sell it for a dollar to the wholesalers. 
the average shelf life for a book about outlaw bikers is 30 or 40 years that we know of right now. I truly believe that 100 years from now, the lifestyle will be completely gone. There'll be nothing left of it at all. And just like uh, we look back on the Wild West and we have to read books about it to see what it was like, uh, I suspect that people will still be reading my books 100 years from now to see what the lifestyle was all about. And, that's the and, perfect analogy to yeah. me. That's what, that's how, and, and this, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, time is short here. I'm, I'm yeah. running out of my time with you. <laughs> but uh, this is why I'm, this, I'm curious why there is more, isn't more content out there in terms of films and television that is real because uh, there's so, you know, Westerns were so big. And I'm sure you, know, I don't have to tell you this. When we were growing up, Westerns were just huge. They were the, the film that people were interested in. Lots of them. There were billions of them. We don't see, as you mentioned, a lot of, uh, a lot of real content uh, in, you know, biker lifestyle, which I equate to old Western stuff. There is a romantic element. Why, are, why isn't there more content, do you think? Well, first of all, the, the, the lifestyle is very secretive. That's to start. Second of all, most people that have anything important to say, you know, were messed up on drugs or alcohol and did not preserve their memories accurately, right? <laughs> That's what another you part why, of it, Yeah, why you could still remember it, right? <laughs> yeah. Another, another factor in that is that most people are dead. And wow. there's still a, a bunch that are in prison for life. But, you know, out of the original crew going back in seven in the 70s, you know, very few of those people are still around. So it is very difficult. Uh, You know, me, I'm fortunate. I'm intelligent. Uh, I wasn't involved in drugs or alcohol. I was basically my last drink was in the early 80s. So for most of my career in the Outlaw Motorcycle Club world, you know, I was sober and uh, I ran a business for most of that time. So if I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico and had a pack of 100 bikes with me and we were gassing up at a shell station, I had the receipt because I wrote it off of my taxes because I was out there trying to do business. Right. <laughs> so I knew exactly to the minute, you know, where I where I was located as at most of the times. So mo- I would say that probably 99.9% of what I've written is dead accurate down to the day that it happened. But that's an unusual luxury. Most people yeah. don't have that, right? Yeah, nobody takes notes. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And another aspect that, you know, I've got thousands of photos. The whole time I was taking photographs and videos and, you know, I was in Europe taking care of things over there for the club and, and I videoed, the, you know, my journeys over there. So I have probably, you know, one of the larger libraries of photographic and video content in addition to all of my literary content. Wow. Uh, I only have one minute left with you. I just wanted to talk about film now. Uh, do you, it, is it the same challenge with film as far as uh, getting some, uh, like, uh, basically a, a publishing house to being self-published with films? Are you having to do all your independent productions yourself, or, or, or are you uh, seeking backing? And, and if so, uh, how, how does that work? I, I did my own for a while, but it's just cost prohibitive. And the distribution channels, the return on the dollar are, are not worth the time and effort. Uh, my big challenge in this day and age is finding people that want to capture the lifestyle accurately. You know, they want to focus on one violent incident, for example, or something like that. And it's it's not definitive of who we are and who we were. Uh, so that's a challenge. I remember a Discovery guy, a Discovery uh, Channel guy telling me that I want to see bikers killing bikers. I, right. I said, for real? He said, oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you do that? I said, <laughs> maybe I could, but I'm not going to, you know, yeah, yeah, but that's, that's what they want. That's, that's what, he, he, that's what feel. sells television. Right? right. And he expected that I was going to be, be able to provide him access to actually go out and watch a biker, kill a biker live on TV. That's how ignorant they were. Yeah. Uh, I did a, uh, a spec deal for TLC channel a long time ago uh, called biker chicks. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. But uh, uh, anyway, I, uh, when I delivered it to them, you know, they said, this would be great. Can you get these women to stab each other and fight each other? You know, like desperate housewives, right? <laughs> and I just laughed. said, you're not, the, you're not the right place for this show. See you later. 
Right. Yeah. I can I, you know, but there are, uh, and I, I know we're out of time here, but I'm thinking, and I, I, please don't take this as an insult that I keep equating it to what I know, the world I grew up in. And, uh, but the Sopranos, David Chase, uh, was really good at just minimizing. It, sometimes he went over the top with the violence, but he, he didn't just put in gratuitous violence all the time. There was story building stuff. And, and the violence was just part of that life, the way he portrayed it. So I think there are uh, directors or filmmakers out there that would have an interest in it. It's really difficult because the audience does want, they want gratuitous violence. They want it nonstop. You know, they want Pulp Fiction. Not, or I don't know, Pulp, Pulp Fiction is not a good one. Rumblefish or something. They want, you know, nonstop action. Yeah, David. but I, and I would love to meet somebody like David Chase that had that outlook on life. Uh, you know, I've only told probably 20% of my life. I've got lots of stories to tell. You know, I just got to find the right person to tell the story. Well, well so, good luck with that. I hope, I hope yeah. you do succeed in that. And um, I appreciate I know this isn't something that, that you like to do. I think uh, you probably uh, don't see a lot of uh, benefit ba- back from this, but I appreciate you uh, coming here and sharing this in- information. I will do what I can to try to promote you as a- best I can, talk about your books, and that's uh, that's all I can promise uh, in the way of returning the favor. I do appreciate you coming here tonight. And, and, no problem. I appreciate being on, and don't worry too much about that promotion, because like I said, nothing works. <laughs> yeah, well, you said one thing works, and that's other somebody you don't know talking about uh, talking to somebody else you don't know, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to people you don't know. Oh, yeah, and, and you know, and that, and the third part of that is that you know you didn't create the situation, because right. you know, like uh, you know, having somebody write a book review, a fake book review for Amazon, right? right. You're creating a situation, right, through false right. marketing. It, it, it's got to be sincere. It's got to be real. I appreciate right. it, Matt, a bunch. Uh, feel Thank free you. to reach out to me in the future, and uh, thanks a bunch for contacting me. Thank you. BlockheadCity.com, folks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Edward. Have a great night and bye for now. You too, Matt. Bye bye. Edward Winterholder, folks. Uh, good stuff there. You know, uh, just scratching the, the, the surface there, but um, it it's really surprising to me that there are not that because I understand his principal take on this. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to do that. You know, don't just glorified rumble fish. I don't know. Why am I picking on Quentin Tarantino? Just the gratuitous violence for sake of gratuitous violence. But I'm surprised there aren't more of those just, you know, based on the biker life. Uh, you had, you know, you know, the shows that were out there. And again, I don't want to mention them and, and give them any publicity that they don't need, but there aren't that many. There were never that many. And it's, it's, it's curious to me. Why? Uh, because it is, it got, does have a degree of romance or like the old West or like organized crime genre does have. So it's just curious to me. I hope you enjoyed this program. I hope you tell your friends about it. Go to Blockhead City, check out all 42 books that it was written. He's also a singer and songwriter and musician, uh, record producer. Uh, I don't know if I failed to mention that, but I got quite a, a resume, quite a life, and uh, a lot to offer. So, blockheadcity.com. 